Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth and the last episode of this um, you know, short series based on the book, How to Live a Good Life, which I co-edited with my friends and colleagues, Dan Kaufman and Sky Cleary. Today, we're going to talk about Confucianism and Taoism, and we have two guests who will be introduced in a minute. Our host today is, in fact, Dan Kaufman. Dan is a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. He hosts the SOFIA program on uh, Meaning Life of Life TV and edits and publishes The Electric Agora, an online magazine devoted to the intersection of philosophy, the humanities, and sciences, as well as popular culture. He lives in Springfield, Missouri, with his wife, Nancy, and a high school teacher, and their daughter, Victoria. Dan, take it away. Well, it's nice to be here, um, and, and a little bittersweet to be doing the last uh, of these. Um, um, I wish we could have gotten everybody to everybody in the book to do them, but um, um, I, we should be happy with the the uh, number we've got. Um, and um, um, our last, we have our la the last two of the of our participants today, both of whom have contributed really uh, terrific chapters to this book. Um, um, Brian Van Norden and Robin Wong, um, who respectively have penned the uh, chapters on um, uh, Confucianism and Taoism. And so we're going to talk to them about that today. Um, and uh, as, I, as I did last time, I mean, I would like to start simply by having uh, uh, Drs. Van Norden and Wong talk about a little bit how they came to um, the, the particular philosophies of life that they, that they live and that they've written about in the book and what they take to be the core, core elements um, of those respective philosophies. So why don't we start with Dr. Van Norden and then we'll go over to Dr. Wong. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm uh, Professor Van Norden. I teach at Vassar College in the US and I'm part of the generation that got very interested in Chinese culture in the 70s, and a couple of things were very important. The US renormalized relations with the People's Republic of China. So everybody was very excited. I remember as a child watching Nixon shaking Mao's hand um, and uh, visiting the Great Wall. So uh, people knew that this was a new stage in China-American relations. And also, to be really honest, uh, the Bruce Lee film, Enter the Dragon, was an international success. And everybody was just really excited about uh, uh, Chinese martial arts. Um, ironically, I later studied Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is neither uh, Chinese nor uh, purely Japanese either. Uh, but anyway, these things got me interested in Chinese culture. And I'm from a, a charming but very small town in Western Pennsylvania named Latrobe, which uh, at its peak when I was population was about 15,000 people. Um, and I once, check the demographics on it. Uh, Latrobe is literally about 99% white and about 99% Christian. So you couldn't get much farther away from uh, China or, or multicultural philosophy where I started. But I got interested in China because of things like Bruce Lee's film and the reopening of China to the West under Mao and then later, especially under Deng Xiaoping. Uh, so I decided to learn a little bit about China. So I, when I went to college, I studied some Western philosophy, and I wanted to study Chinese philosophy, but I found it was almost impossible to study Chinese philosophy uh, in Western colleges and universities. So I was a little bit self-taught, but I also did learn the Chinese language. And, and I, I guess I was a little naive or, uh, you know, sometimes I'm told that I'm oppositional defiant, meaning when people tell me to do things, I tend to do the opposite. So I, I asked some of my teachers whether, you know, how could I learn about Chinese philosophy? And I was told that there is no such thing as Chinese philosophy. So I decided to go to graduate school in Chinese philosophy to prove them wrong. Uh, and when I went, I really didn't know that much about Chinese philosophy because as I say, it was almost impossible to study it. But I went to Stanford and at that time, there were several people there working in Chinese philosophy, including the late David Nivison, uh, P.J. Ivanhoe was at Stanford at this time, and also uh, Lee Yearly, uh, who still is at Stanford, was one of my mentors in the study of Chinese thought. 
So I got uh, interested in Chinese philosophy. I finally learned about it. And once I learned about it, I was blown away. Uh, and in particular, I realized that for me, the teachings of Confucianism were deeply meaningful and I felt like they had a lot to offer uh, people, if uh, just ordinary people as well as scholars. So I've dedicated my life to teaching people about Chinese philosophy. So that's how I ended up uh, here. And actually, you know, since that was so nicely con tough contained, we'll get to the thing of what the core elements are after Robin maybe talks. About. So Dr. Wang, maybe you could talk about how you came to your, to, to Taoism. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me here. This is uh, um, very honored to talk with you, to share uh, with uh, you my uh, experience. And uh, so I actually trained uh, all the way from undergraduate, graduate is in philosophy. And when I was in Peking University, I'm really, really fascinated by Western philosophy, particularly Hegel. The Hegel is absolute the spirit and this individuality just just blow my mind and I truly enjoyed it. And then I come to the West, I um, studied philosophy. So then I take a comparative approach to um, a you know, Western and the Eastern philosophy. Um, I think then I've been teaching, you know, comparative ethics, Aristotle, Kant, the Mill, Confucius, and the Taoism all the time. But uh, gradually, my shift is starting to change. There's, uh, I think, the most important uh, uh, experience maybe for me to shift to Taoism is uh, uh, being mother. So uh, the motherhood really make me think, wow, I'm responsible for these two girls, two human beings. How do I raise them? You know, I, it's, uh, it's hard to put the absolute spirit into life, into motherhood. So, and gradually I think, wow, and more and more realize it, um, you know, Western philosophy seems like a, a get me a job, and but the Taoism give me a life. So mm -hmm. then, especially when you're getting older, then you think more big pictures. Uh, what's uh, exactly you do with your life, and uh, those whole those things that like I want this a total treatment. So and the more and the more I focus my um, research, teaching, and the personal interest on Taoism. So I get into this path. All right, that's, that's terrific. Um, uh, and and I, I, I am going to, let me just preface before you do the next round. I am going to ask about, because this is unusual in that, that we have two people who are experts in two, two philosophies from the same, the same uh, civilization. And so I'm going to ask you about, to both talk about what you see as the relationships between them and the, maybe the roles that they play in Chinese civilization, respectively. But before I get to that, let me first have each of you describe what you take to be sort of the essential or core elements. Obviously, these are tremendously complex, uh, you know, long-standing traditions. But maybe just pull out a few elements that you think are particularly uh, uh, salient and worth and worth uh, and worth attending to. Uh, Dr. Van Norden first. Sure. Uh, well, one way to think about Confucianism, and, and you can actually use this same way of thinking for other systems as well, is to think of it in terms of four elements. So first, what is the way of life recommended by this worldview? Second, what virtues, what traits of character do you need to have in order to live that way of life? Third, how do you cultivate those virtues so that you can live that way of life? And fourth, what does human nature have to be like so that you can cultivate those virtues so that you can live that way of life? So on those four things, Confucianism <laughs> offers a very distinctive account of what it is to live well, which is that living well is being a member of a community and in particular having uh, relationships to friends and family members uh, and members of your immediate community that have a special weight to you, a special importance in your life. So Confucians uh, think that in the words of one famous Confucian, uh, within the four C's, all people are brothers and sisters. 
So there is a kind of universal element to Confucianism, but Confucianism is perhaps uh, unique among major world philosophies in really emphasizing the importance of the family, of your spouse, of your romantic partner, of your children, of your parents, and how the relationships you have with these individuals define who you are, but also you know, give meaning to your life. And Confucians have had a lot of different views on the four topics I mentioned, although they tend to agree that a good life is a life that's rich in personal commitments, uh, and rich in relationships with other human beings in society. Uh, but they've had different views about the other topics, but a very common view, one that became orthodox, was that for Confucians, the key virtues are benevolence, which is having compassion for the suffering of others and acting on that compassion, righteousness or integrity, which is doing what is appropriate for you, especially in the face of temptations and being ashamed to do what is wrong, even when there are strong temptations to do what is wrong. Wisdom, which is knowing the best means to achieve your ends, your goals, and also being a good judge of the character of others. And uh, also, uh, finally, ritual or propriety, which is being skillful in following social conventions and rituals. And rituals cover everything from things like marriage ceremonies to funerals, but also greeting guests and just basic matters of social etiquette. Um, and so these four virtues, benevolence, righteousness, or integrity, wisdom, and propriety, or, or ritual propriety, are the four key Confucian virtues. And then gradually, Confucians have, uh, have kind of come together on the view that human nature is good. And what they mean by saying that human nature is good is not that everybody is already good, but that humans have an active potential to become good, active tendencies toward compassion for the suffering of others, an active tendency to be ashamed at doing things that get you short-term benefits at the expense of giving up your integrity, that these things are innate to human nature and that that's the basis on which we can cultivate virtues. Because it's hard to understand how you could cultivate a virtue like benevolence if it weren't there at least incipiently within your nature so that you could cultivate it. Um, so this is the, uh, in a nutshell, the Confucian view. Living a life rich in personal commitments uh, on the basis of benevolence, righteousness, uh, wisdom and propriety and developing the goodness that is already there in an inchoate or incipient form in your nature through things like ritual practices, meditation, reading the right kinds of books, etc. Um, you know, one of the few cross-civilizational comparisons that's often made and has been made to me on more than one occasion is between uh, Confucianism and, and, and Aristotle. Um, um, and, and some of what you said is very, I, 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 it so happens I wrote the chapter on Aristotle for the book. Um, could you maybe say something about what you feel about that comparison, Dr. Van Norden? Is it overstated? Do you think it's, it's a useful comparison? What, what, tell us something about that. Uh, I think it is. I mean, one of my, my scholarly works is uh, virtue ethics and consequentialism in uh, early Chinese philosophy, which is right there on the shelf behind me. And I argued at length that there were important similarities, but also important differences between Confucian and Aristotelian approaches to ethics. Here's something I sometimes say with my students. Broadly speaking, there's a couple ways you could think about ethics. And my philosophy colleagues will know I'm oversimplifying a lot, but I think as a starting point, this is useful. You can think about ethics as like side constraints, kind of like the, the gutters um, on a bowling lane or the guardrails on the highway. And then you can do whatever you want in life. Whatever you want in life is kind of morally irrelevant as long as you don't bounce off against the, the, the guardrails or go into the gutter. And those gutters or those guardrails are ethical rules or ethical principles like don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. Uh, and as long as you don't violate those, you've led a good life. But then another conception of ethics, and, and of course the conception of ethics I just gave you is familiar to 
uh, there's a Kantian understanding of ethics, but it, there's a way in which you could understand utilitarianism as, as, as being similar to that. Um, but then the other way to think about ethics is it's like a work of art. So if you're painting a painting or you're sculpting a statue, every aspect of it is relevant to the beauty of the resulting product. So on this other way of thinking about ethics, everything you do in life contributes to being a certain kind of beautiful person. And that person is the person of good character or the person of virtue, the, the junza, the noble or gentle person in the Confucian tradition. You might say like the phronomos or the, depending on how you conceptualize it, the person who's great soul, who has megalosuchia in the, the Aristotelian tradition. So Confucians and Aristotelians to me are very similar in that they're interested in constructing an overall way of life where everything you do is ethically relevant, including how you greet your friends, how you treat your friends, um, how you treat strangers, uh, how you dress, um, how you go about your daily life. And this is a sharp contrast with other ethical systems that just emphasize not overstepping the bounds provided by ethical rules. So in that respect, I think they're very similar. I think some of the big differences are, as you know, Dan, uh, it depends on how you read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. But on one way of reading the Nicomachean Ethics, his conception of living well is similar to what seems to be Plato's, which is that the highest kind of life yeah. is the life of theoretical contemplation. So being a physicist like Einstein um, or a mathematician, um, somebody who studies very abstract thought is the, the be, that's the best way of life. This is what's suggested in book 10 of the Nicomachean Ethics. But in other parts of the Nicomachean Ethics, including it's suggested in parts of book one, the, the good life is the life of political activity in the community, where what's really important is to be a member of the polis, a member of the city state, and to be active in the affairs of it. And it's certainly the Confucian view is closer to this other view of humans as primarily social or communal or political animals. But part of what some people have argued is that certainly in the Republic of Plato, you get this vision of the highest kinds of people of having their spouses and their children in common because an ideal philosopher should have transcended the limitations of the family. And Aristotle, of course, questions that ideal and says, look, it's just unrealistic to think we're going to get rid of the family for philosophers. But the, the family unit for Aristotle seems mostly like a, an organic tool for producing philosophers like Aristotle, producing and maintaining philosophers like Aristotle, who can then do the important activities like theoretical contemplation or participating in the community. Whereas Confucian stressed the fact that actually being a member of a family is flourishing. At one point, someone challenged Confucius and said, hey, how come you don't have a position in government? And in fairness, Confucius did sometimes have positions in government and he sought positions in government because he wanted to make the world a better place. But sometimes he couldn't find a position. And he replied by saying, hey, you know what? Just by being a good brother, I'm being a good person. I'm contributing to the, the government of my society by being a good brother. So by being a good brother, being a good uh, uncle or aunt or nephew or niece or husband or wife or just a friend, you're contributing to living well. Thank you so much, that's terrific. Um, I, I wish we had three hours because I would like to keep po poking around there. Um, Dr. Wang, why don't, why don't you give us your sense of what you take to be some really notable elements within the Taoist framework? Okay. Sure, thank you. So Taoism, basically, for quickly saying, it's a nature-inspired theory and a practice. However, this itself, Taoism, uh, I think maybe there's three things that we can think about how do we understand the Taoism. First of all, I wanted to, because Taoism is this concept itself, is so complicated. And uh, there is, uh, well, one way to think about Taoism is refer to two classical texts, the Tao Te Ching and the Zhuangzi. Um, then there is also Taoism maybe divided in the movement uh, and the uh, schools, the lineage, 
and uh, Taoism, so-called Taoism as religion, Taoism as philosophy school. So that itself is a whole debate. But also another thing is when Europeans uh, came to China and they endorsed Confucianism and then especially Jesuits, they think uh, Taoism is uh, superstitious. And then there is a long tradition denying Taoism. And for example, even uh, Max Weber thinking Taoism just some sort of ma magic. So there is lots of misunderstanding and uh, uh, bias uh, uh, a, a, the idea uh, against the Taoism around the term of Taoism or also understand the Taoist, Taoist thought and the practice. So I think there's three things. One is a Tao, is a Tao particularly I refer to, will be uh, Tao Te Ching and the Zhuangzi as the two of these important philosophical texts. We, they really provide a, a different narratives about the reality, about the nature. So let's think about how do we think about the cosmology? How do we think about those ontological problems? See, like the quote of Tao Te Ching 42, think about the Tao generate the one, one generate the two, two, two generate three, three generate many other things. And the many other things carry in, embrace the young, and the blind energy attending harmony. So this is simple statement actually a a, we see it refers to two things. One, the world is generated. You know, this is a gift. Uh, this is a Tao is the main idea, a uh, cosmology to think about the world. It's not a Newtonian uh, uh, clock, but, but rather I call the Zhuangzi's waterfall, field of emergence and uh, generation. So, um, so uh, another thing we can see is the world, the myriad the things that contain a certain kind of rhythm you know, uh, a, a pattern and uh, a regularity. And so this is, for example, the idea, every existence has a two aspect, the carrying or embodied in and the in, in front, confront is a yang. So this uh, in yang um, interaction, so this interaction actually shows many other things that come into being through connectivity. So connectivity, interrelatedness, and all this is the one of a uh, story we can see uh, uh, Taoists tell us. So I think this is uh, um, the, uh, everything that we can look at okay, from the cosmic way to think about it. Um, so a uh, second thing, and uh, I will see Taoism is a critique. In what kind of way to think about the critique in the sense of looking for alternatives and uh, alternative possibilities. And it's a create, this a critique, it's a create a social, personal, and uh, uh, mental, I will say, space. Space is to um, open for explorations, open for doubts, and uh, so basically reshaping our intellectual landscape, uh, landscape by asking uh, some questions. So this is what we see the Zhuangzi, right? So Zhuangzi think about uh, we, sh we should uh, um, always take a different perspective or the one word says uh, walking two roads. So, so the double walking, you're always, always able to see a different perspectives. And um, now, this is a, a, one way to reach that a stage, right? So that is, a, a Zhuangzi have this idea called the fasting of mind, Xinzai, basically put your mind on diet. And mm -hmm. the, um, this diet, what it exactly means, so we will see is actually to a, reach this is a illumination. So give you, bring you clarity. So it's always the uh, Zhuangzi suspect a social, um, we say, a formation, you know, social uh, conventional standard. That's become a problem. Problem to, um, so that's what we will see. You see, therefore you're blind. And uh, uh, you listen, therefore uh, you are deaf. You, you speak, therefore you are silent. So this is kind of very Johnson's story, the text story, you consider so, so many absurd uh, um, 
a strange a stories drawn to this text, but this absurdity can really sharp our uh, thinking and give our uh, a different perspectives. So I, I think uh, um, this is, that's why also uh, caused a, a quite a bit of uh, problems when people thinking about the uh, uh, Taoist teachings by Sir Zhuangzi, I couldn't really figure out what this talk about. Right? So it's really knock you off, give you a different way to think about the, the world. So for example, something what is beautiful. Every seems like a, the ugly hench bounce. All this have this internal virtue. The, you know what's the important? So um, this is uh, uh, one uh, second things, and then the third things I, I was thinking about the Taoism as a strategy as a strategy, strategy of living well. This living well, um, you can see, um, you can form a different way we think about. The very simple way started with, it's the way to looking at our human body because that's the space you uh, occupied or inhabited in this world, right? So, um, so this is the space, then what do you do? It's, uh, there is a misunderstanding, you think a lot, uh, Taoism is just selfish, just think about immortality, but actually um, that, this, this is a bias a certain way. So I will see is uh, Taoism is a, one of the things you can think about this uh, living uh, a strategy is a nourishment. How, how can you, um, to first of all, Understand your body, right? Your body consists of three elements: the, the physical form, the uh, the sheen, the the uh, energy flow, the qi, and the spirit. And uh, so the shen. Now, with this, this is your precondition for you um, to living, you know, uh, to in uh, to experience this world. So then, you how can you, you know? take advantage of this, you know, to cultivate the body, be healthy. They, and, uh, but that's just the beginning. That's a minimal requirement. More importantly, how do you be a good a human beings? Okay. Now, then there is a specific way we can think about it. One of the strategy, maybe we can think about a Taoist strategy. I always think, can use the example of Yu uh, in Chinese, but it's the territory, is riding horses. Riding mm -hmm. horses is, a, is a, one of six art, the liberal art uh, training, that one of it is riding horses. If you think about the riding horses, it's not about the domination of horses, right? You think about you have horse the temperament, you, you have uh, weather, and uh, you also have a terrain, you have your goal, how long this journey will be uh, take, and then you also have your own emotional state. And uh, so all, when you're riding horses, you integrate the different elements, all these elements into one. So the, 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 there is Taoist texts that often talk about, especially the leads. You, you pull, you, you take, you push, you gave. You know, this is in the world, you're always taking and giving. Push and the pull. In this is very context-based strategy, living in this world. And then I think this is um, one of my very important uh, aspect we think about uh, a, a Taoist uh, uh, teaching. Um, I, I think, of course, Taoism using the whole thing, this, uh, uh, we will say, conceptualize the Taoist philosophy using different uh, metaphors. Like they were think, uh, thinking about the uh, 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 empty space in, uh, in, in the whale. And the, the, we, we, we think about the uh, uh, clay making cups, the windows, the doors, the, the empty space become a very important uh, uh, aspect of the Taoist teaching. From this natural phenomena, and then we actually can learn a great deal with it, and then to have our action aligned with, um, you know, cosmic order.
and the pattern because this exists in our body, in the event, in the world, and in the cosmos. Now, lastly, I want to see in chapter 67, Dao De Jing, Dao, uh, uh, Dao De Jing Sing, Dao has three treasures, right? So we already know that Dao is a, a three treasures. One is compassion. So how you have this nourishing attitude towards the myriad of things. Allow myriad of things to, to be themselves. This we go to the idea of zilan or action of wu wei. This is talk so much, so I, I want to use a different way to think about it. So another one is the second treasure is the simplicity, uh, the frugality we'll see. It's a, it, how can we live, you know, being a, to return to fundamental, what the re, most important things in our life. You know, everyone now is locked down. You will think about the return to home, return to the root. Home suddenly become office, school, and the gym become everything, right? So then you really find out what is actually really sustain our life in this world. The simplicity. We become so resourceful. We do think about how do we make a, a way, a better living. So I think this um, right now pandemic really gave us a moment of doubt. And it is um, the way we rethinking about our life itself, the meaning of life and the beyond. So the third thing, it's, it's a, a little bit harder to ex, is explain, but it's basically in the literary meaning is you, you do not set, stand friend of the world, you know, and uh, this is, can be a misunderstood in many ways, but I want to see is to let, to have the trust to the natural rhythm of the saints, you know, to, to, to light the Go, let it go your own self. Like that's the, the similar Buddhism in Confucius all has these uh, dimensions. But uh, but at the same time, it doesn't mean you don't do anything. Just being, you know, couch potato or complete loser. But they want to be success with Taoist success has its take its own uh, path. Now the Rather, we can see non-linear dynamics to find what is the best, what's your strengths on there, and rely on your strengths, and then, so, then you can strive. So it's not blind. So I, I think that probably, yeah, I will stop here. And then <laughs> just, just a quick, you know, summary. Okay. Um... I'm, I, I, there's a lot of things I'd like to ask, um, but the main purpose of these engagements are so that, that the, the people in the audience can ask. So maybe some of the things that I would have asked will come out in the questions that are, that the people are going to pose. Um, um, I'm assuming that the people who are here are aware of how to use the hand raising method to, um, to ask a question. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go pick the hands in the order that they appear. And then um, uh, Massimo is going to unmute the person and uh, that person will be able to ask a question. And please um, do ask a question. Don't make a speech. Make the question relatively short um, and direct the question either to Dr. Van Norden or to Dr. Wang or indicate that you'd like them both to uh, remark upon them. So um, the first person I see who had their hand up uh, originally is Alex. And so maybe Massimo could go ahead and unmute Alex and let Alex ask uh, his question. Hi there, thank you. Uh, this is Alex here. Um, I wanna say thanks to both speakers um, for uh, great presentations. My question is for Dr. Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang, you, you said that you had studied Hegel originally um, and you're also a specialist in Taoism. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the uh, some of the parallels and the differences between Hegelianism and uh, Taoism. The reason I ask, of course, is that the, you know the famous dialectic in Hegel, um, at least on the surface, 
seems to be, um, you know, very similar to the yin yang uh, duality. And I'm wondering, you know, how deep does the similarity go and what are also the differences between uh, the two approaches? Thank you. Okay, so this is a huge question, okay? There's really long and I've been thinking about this. But uh, um, first of all, I probably want to starting to talk about the yin-yang du du duality, using the word duality. So I actually wrote, wrote a book on yin-yang. So, and uh, um, now I don't think uh, we should think about the yin-yang as a duality. So that's the one because it's, you can see polar, polarity. And uh, because it, there is no yin without yang, there is no yang within yin. So now we're back to Hegelian's, you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So for he Hegelian's, this view, this is a rational conceptual uh, construction of the we see the world, oh, and uh, so the sea, the, the uh, certain ways, the patterns of this world. So in this kind of sense, the same like on the superficial reading, yes, there is a similarity. So then Tao is the way to thinking about the world, how to interaction play the world, uh, play the roles, and the, how interaction come about the new uh, the uh, beings, uh, emergence come. But I do want to see this uh, very quickly, very briefly, and uh, the uh, difference. So for Hegelian, there is a close rational process. There is a thirdness, almost done. That's ideal. For Taoist, yin yang interaction, it's open, it's open process. You're always facing the uh, with the new opportunities. So that's what I take in Dao. Dao is doing the best. It's dealing with uncertainty because always it can ride into a new opportunities. Always being, can handle the problems in life. Anything probably for Taoism, we're able to uh, a process it. So in another way, you can think about Taoism as a therapy. You don't always give you an answer, but this answer is not a one way, but the rather uh, the, 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 uh, the multiple ways and to, to think about this. I, well, one way we think about the, you know, uh, Hegelian's uh, di dialectical progression is a straight line going up. For a Tao, let's use Zhuang as a metaphor of center and a circle. You know, you always have your core you root this core and you can spin in with this world. And you always, you know, to get access uh, of Tao. So that, that is the uh, main, maybe two images can do, um, yeah, to understand both. Thank you for your question. Dr. Van Orden, did you want to say something about Hegel and Tao? I, I did, yeah. Um, excellent question and great response from uh, Professor Long. I wanted to add, I, I think Professor Wong knows this, there's a, a Chinese Confucian philosopher uh, of the I think 18th century, Zhang Xuecheng, and he's often compared to Hegel. And one of the, I consider myself kind of a Hegelian as well, and Hegel's major contribution to philosophy is to argue that morality and rationality need to be historicized so that what it is rational to believe and what is moral depends on the historical era that you're in. And we got a similar view from this a very uh, interesting but understudied Chinese Confucian philosopher, Zhang Xuecheng. And Zhang Xuecheng famously said, there are too many people who are trying to do what Confucius did instead of trying to do what Confucius would do if he were in our historical situation. So Confucius lived in a kind of early uh, Iron Age, late Bronze Age, early Iron Age society that was largely agrarian and which democracy was not practical. Uh, if we're going to follow Confucius, John would say, we shouldn't try to just do what Confucius did, which was completely appropriate in his historical context, We've got to update and apply Confucius's principles to our contemporary situation. 
So that's a way in which we can make Confucianism relevant to contemporary society uh, in a way that doesn't involve just copying what people did in the past. The only other thing I'd like to say about Hegel is, although I'm a fan of Hegel's philosophy in many respects, as I point out in one of my other books, uh, Taking Back Philosophy, A Multicultural Manifesto, Hegel and Kant were major figures in turning Western philosophy against Indian philosophy and Chinese or East Asian philosophy. So earlier, in, when people in the West first learned about Indian or South Asian philosophy, like the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, um, or when they first learned about Confucian philosopher, philosophy, Westerners embraced it with open arms. But then later thinkers like uh, Kant and Hegel, and this was continued in the 20th century by people like Heidegger and Derrida, argued that there is no philosophy in the uh, Asian traditions. And indeed, some of them, like Kant said, actually, Kant actually says that uh, people of Asian descent are just innately incapable of the abstraction that's required from philosophy, uh, for philosophy. And anybody who actually bothers to read either Indian or, or Ch East Asian philosophy knows that's false. All right, guys, um, I'm just gonna interject for a second here. We have a lot of questions and only about 15 minutes left. So what I would ask is then is gonna you know, tell me who I'm, gonna, I'm going to let um, ask the question next. And I will ask both uh, Brian and Robin to be uh, more concise so that we can get more questions in if you, if you can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, next up, uh, Massimo is uh, Lionel Fernandez. If uh, you'll- uh, yeah, you thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted uh, to ask Dr. Brian uh, a question about uh, the contrast between the Christian worldview of how to live a good life and the Confucian or the Taoist uh, version. Because according to Christianity, human nature by itself is fallen and requires grace or kind of a divine intervention so that the interplay between free will, if you like, and grace is what makes for an integral, well-ordered life, which left to itself would go off the rails, as it were. Is there something similar in, uh, in either tradition uh, akin to this? Well, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I actually wrote an essay about this uh, a while back, and... I think that is one of the major differences between at least the classical Christian tradition, uh, which in thinkers like St. Augustine emphasizes the fallenness of human nature and the, the need for divine grace, and the Confucian view, which has evolved into the view that human nature is fundamentally good. Um, so uh, I think that is a, a big difference. In a way, I, I like the optimism of the Confucian view, the belief that we are fundamentally good or we're good in the sense that we have a potential which we can actualize with, through our own exercise and the help of others, uh, as opposed to the pessimism of the view of original sin. However, Augustine was also insightful in pointing out that sometimes humans do wrong just for the sake of doing wrong, uh, even if it doesn't benefit them. And so you look at things like the Holocaust, just orgies of evil and wrongdoing that just seem inexplicable, even in terms of narrow self-interest. That's an insight that Augustine had about human nature. And those kinds of really radical sorts of human evil are hard for Confucians to explain, given the, the view that human nature is good. Robin, he did okay. ask about but, Taoism on this question. So would you like to try and answer yeah. that as well? Okay, very quick. I just want to say Taoism do not, does not need a human actually in certain, certain ways. Although they think about the relational self like Confucius, but the Taoism most emphasize on close with nature, with nature in the sense, you know, with the with the earth, with animals, with the mountains, with the rivers, and all this, you can live a good life. So lifestyle counts. So then we, yeah, I'm, I don't have time to get into what is a Taoist lifestyle, but I just want to see Taoists think, 
you know, uh, Confucian need people, people in order to practice the virtue or the need of society, or Christians need society. Taoism can have society, but it is, don't have it, that will be fine too. Not necessarily say you're all going to the islands, but, but it does have, see, you can, you have this sustainable lifestyle will make you live well. Okay, that. Okay, next Massimo is uh, Tim Luo. If you could unmute uh, him, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, so I was wondering about the role of reason in the uh, Chinese philosophy, and this is uh, directed to both Dr. Wang and Dr. Van Norden. Um, it strikes me that in Western um, virtue ethics, like Stoicism, for example, uh, reason is a huge part in, for example, distinguishing between what is up to you and what isn't and uh, all that. So I'm wondering, is there anything equivalent in Taoism and Confucianism? Yes. Why don't we just keep the order we were in? So why don't you go first, Dr. Van Norden, and then I'll ask Dr. Wang to answer also. Yeah, I think that uh, sometimes people have a, and I'm not saying you do, but I think some, what I found is with students, sometimes people have like this very negative view of reason and they think like, you know, reason is something kind of insidious or they think that, or, or they think that reason is great, but they think it's only a property of Western philosophy. But if reason means thinking constructively and consistently about ethical problems, then of course reason plays a role in uh, Confucian philosophy uh, as much as it does in Aristotelian philosophy. Confucians don't identify reason as a faculty the way that uh, arguably you find in Plato or Aristotle. But we find the Confucian thinkers argue rationally. They give arguments in favor of their views. They respond to counter arguments. They expect a virtuous person to be able to defend uh, what they're saying and be able to justify it. Uh, the, I mean, the Analects, which is the sayings of Confucius and his immediate disciples, is basically people asking Confucius a bunch of questions and him trying to respond intelligently to them. The Mengza, which is one of the, the classics of the Confucian tradition, includes long dialogues and debates where Confucius, uh, sorry, Mengza, this later follower of Confucius, defends rationally his views against competitors. So although Confucians don't identify reason as a distinct faculty, they clearly are capable of arguing rationally, presenting reasons, and they expect a wise person to be able to exercise practical reason. Dr. Wang, so, so how does the Taoist conceive of reason and what role does reason play in the Taoist? Okay, short answer will be, first of all, what is a relational, the Taoism I would consider as a re relational rationality. If you mm. think about the reason, it's a separate than emotion. Reason and, the, and the, a emotion is a separate. All you think about, if you think about the reason, it's a, just a cognitive, conceptual, you know, uh, construction, just like a, a professor of my Northern talk about. Then I, I, I think that a Taoism will be, uh, um, present, we, we will probably question about that way to think about the reason. So I will think about this, in another word, the rational, uh, relational rationality is to think about the things within the context. That's the one. And also narrative is a, is a form of rationality. And also the tool used to uh, exercise this relational rationality is the images and uh, and uh, uh, metaphors that all plays a role for human understanding understanding this world and doing philosophical thinking great that's terrific um i like that expression situational rationality um massimo uh the our next uh person would like to ask a question is Yanfei Shen, if you could unmute. Thank you. Um, hi, my question is for Dr. Van Norden. Um, mm. So growing up Chinese American, I have mm. developed a strong antipathy towards Confucianism because mm. every time my parents bring him up, it's always some passage about listening to your elders and obedience to authority. Um, so my question is, do you think that this has been overblown um, or is this in fact perhaps the central tenet of Confucianism? 
That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I completely sympathize with, uh, with your frustration. Um, uh, let me go out on a limb a little bit here and say something a little controversial uh, and say I've, uh, I've Christian friends who will gladly say that the, the best, they're Christians and they'll say the best argument against Christianity is many contemporary Christians because there are a lot of people who identify as Christians and don't actually put into practice the teachings of love and compassion of Jesus um, and instead use being a Confucian, uh, sorry, being a Christian as an excuse for being self-righteous or condemning others. So likewise, in fairness, there are a lot of people who just use Confucianism as a cultural bludgeon, um, you know, to tell people what to do, but that's not what the true teachings of it are about. And so a lot of what's exciting for me about teaching traditional systems of thought is making people aware of how these traditions are a lot more complicated than they let on. So uh, Confucius specifically says that you have an obligation to argue with your parents if you think they're wrong. And he also says, how could you be loyal to somebody if you don't criticize them? Uh, so, and then there, within the Confucian tradition, Mengzi, uh, again, somebody I've translated, you know, great Confucian philosopher, he talks about Sage King Shun, who had a really dysfunctional family with very evil parents and an evil brother. Um, and uh, so, but, and Mengzi said, sometimes Shun had to disobey his parents or not obey the rituals in following his parents because what they were asking him to do was wrong. So there's actually a lot more complexity in the Confucian view about how you should relate to authority figures. It's not just about obedience, but then people will take the sayings about obedience out of context or not look at the other passages, which give you a more complex view. So I'm very sorry you had that growing up. And you know, again, I would, I would say what a lot of my Christian friends would say about some Christians, which is that they're the best argument against Christianity. And this is coming from Christians who want to see people live up to the true teachings of Christianity. And so I'd invite your parents to read the Analects and read other Confucian texts more carefully because they stress the importance of not being too stern with your children and also the obligation of children to challenge their parents when their parents are wrong. Thank you, that's, that's terrific. Um, uh, Massimo, our next uh, person who'd like to ask a question uh, is Sam. So if you could unmute, please. Uh, hi, uh, I just have a question in terms of um, uh, there's this new book that's come out recently. It's called Why I'm Not a Buddhist by Evan Thompson. And obviously that's about Buddhism, but uh, there is, you know, some, uh, you know, syncretism or overlap between uh, Buddhist, uh, you know, teachings and Taoism. So I'm just curious if you think, if you are familiar with that argument, uh, does any of that apply to Taoism as well, especially the way it is used uh, in the West, and there are some people who use it almost in an instrumental way, like, uh, you know, people in uh, Silicon Valley have been criticized for that. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Are you direct, who are you directing that towards both, uh, towards both of our guests? Yeah, I assume, I'm sorry, he's muted now. I assume that it was toward, to, to Robin since he's talking about that. Yeah, Robin, go ahead. How this stuff is getting used and... <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to say, right, um, right so uh, Taoism, look at the Tao itself, it's a source, right? Tao is not a one person, uh, it's not, it's, Tao is not a Confucius, Tao is not a Buddha, right? Tao is a source, it's a past, it's a journey. So we will see Tao is a lifestyle. Um, so, and uh, if it's a lifestyle, then I don't, I think I really think I am a Taoist, <laughs> you know, I will be a Taoist because I think it is a beneficial, but I, then there is a caution here. You cannot bring any teaching, make a, transform any teaching, become ideology, become a restrict uh, principles, uh, rules. That is not a Tao want, wanted. Okay. Yeah, Brian, okay. I'm done. Um, my, the, our next uh, question is from uh, Michael Leroux, if you wouldn't mind unmuting Massimo. Mm. Hello. 
So first of all, thank you again very much to uh, to the presenters today. Um, my question is for Dr. Wang. Um, I read uh, several different translations of the Tao Te Ching and also the Zhuangzi um, several years ago, and it's given me really a lot to think about. Um, and one of the stumbling blocks that I came across in thinking about some of the, the messages in those texts was, is I think we froze. Massimo, yes. You want to mute? Yeah, I think uh, I think you want to mute, froze. and we'll just go on to the next person. So. Uh, yes. Okay. That's right. I'm sorry, Michael, um, but you yeah. did freeze. So I'm going to go to the next questioner, and I think this will be our last since we're at the end. Uh, either it's Katen or Katen, K-A-T-E-N. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, it's Catherine, but it's good enough. Um, <clears throat> I had a question to uh, Professor Van Norman. I think he mentioned something about the incipient in nature of certain uh, character traits or whatever you call it. Um, how does it, is there any sort of intersection uh, with like how Jung um, perceives like the archetypes of what inherent in their collective archetypes or stuff like that in what you mentioned about Confucianism? Well, that, that's a great question. As you may know, uh, Carl Gustav Jung, the great uh, you know, psychologist and uh, former colleague of Sigmund Freud, was very interested in Asian thought. And in fact, he wrote a foreword to a German translation of the I Ching, the classic of changes. And I sometimes assign Jung's foreword to the classic of changes to my students. Um, but yeah, there's the, I, the Confucian idea is that at some deep level, human nature is the same across time and across cultures. So we're all human beings. We all have the capacity for good. And Mengzi uh, describes that capacity as being like the sprouts of a plant. And he says, like, a, the sprout of an apple tree has the potential, an active potential, if nurtured, to grow into an apple tree and to bear fruit. But if you don't develop that potential, the sprout will wither and die. So likewise, he says, humans innately have a tendency to have compassion for others. And we can choose to strengthen our tendency towards compassion, or we can let it lay fallow and become weak. We have a natural tendency to be ashamed to do certain things. Like, for example, to support a, a ruthless or unprincipled leader. And a person who has developed their sense of integrity will then speak out against a ruthless or unprincipled leader, even if they served in their administration. So giving a speech uh, in that context would be a manifestation of the sprout of uh, righteousness or integrity. So, but, and, but it is similar to Jung's view in believing that there's a commonality at a deep level across human minds. Well, this was terrific. I want to thank um, thank both Dr. Van Norden and Dr. Wong, um, and to thank everybody, all of our participants. And I'm going to turn it over to Massimo uh, to sort of close out, uh, as this also is going to be the last of these uh, conversations. So, Massimo. Thanks, Dan. Uh, this was terrific. Uh, thank you again, everybody who participated to these five episodes. Uh, Dan and uh, Sky Cleary, my, uh, my, my co-editors for the book, the uh, 12 contributors who, uh, additional contributors who wrote chapters, some of whom you've seen in these five uh, uh, video uh, chats. And of course, the hundreds of people who actually came to the chat and asked questions and the thousands that are actually watching, that have been watching these videos on YouTube. So. Uh, this was a very, very interesting experiment uh, after the, the book came out. Obviously, check out the book if you can, if you're interested. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting, good, good contribution, I think, to the general question of how to live a good life, to which, of course, in the end, each one of us has to give our own personal, personal answer. Uh, that's all for today. Stay safe.